Hey guys, in this episode, we're going to be taking a look at a rocket car, the Budweiser Rocket. If you're not familiar with this story, the Budweiser Rocket team claimed that they broke the speed of sound on land on December 17, 1979, 18 years before Andy Green indisputably accomplished that feat in Thrust SSC. We're going to be taking a look at the Budweiser Rocket today and examining this claim. Did it really break the speed of sound? Did it really go Mach 1? Stay tuned, you're not going to want to miss this one, guys. Before we get going, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell. Like that. The story of the Budweiser rocket begins with this guy, Bill Frederick, an Australian living in Chatsworth, California, northeast of L.A. Frederick had gotten into jets in the early 1960s with a jet car called Valkyrie, driven by Gary Gablich, among others. Frederick showed up at Bonneville with Valkyrie for Speed Week in 1962, but the car didn't meet the organizer's insurance requirements. No high-speed tires, for one thing, so he wasn't allowed to run it. Now, fast forward to 1971. Frederick comes out with a new car, a 27-foot-long rocket car he calls Courage of Australia, putting out about 6,100 pounds of thrust. It's basically a scaled-down version of the Blue Flame, the rocket car that Gary Gablich drove the year before to a new land speed record of 622 miles per hour. Courage of Australia does a pretty good job on the drag strips, hitting 311 miles per hour on the quarter-mile course. Frederick then goes on to build a bigger rocket car, SMI Motivator, with the idea of going after the land speed record. It has a hydrogen peroxide rocket, same as Courage of Australia, but packing more power, more thrust, bigger fuel tank, longer burn time. The plan was that Hollywood stuntman and film director Hal Needham would drive it. If you've seen the Quentin Tarantino movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you know that character Brad Pitt plays? That's based on Hal Needham. So Hal Needham is going to drive SMI Motivator, after Kitty O'Neill uses it to set the women's speed record. Hal is going to drive it for the ultimate land speed record, Gablich's 622 miles per hour, and then go on to break the speed of sound on land, Mach 1. That's the plan. But it didn't work out. Needham had a very close call in the car, badly damaged it, and nearly got killed. After that, he vowed he would never drive it again. So Frederick goes back into his shop, and he builds a third rocket car, the Budweiser Rocket, named after the car's lead sponsor. This new car, it's almost identical to SMI Motivator, but with something extra. Above the hydrogen peroxide rocket, Frederick installs a solid fuel rocket from a Sidewinder missile to give the vehicle five seconds of additional thrust. Okay, so it's September 1979. The Budweiser rocket is ready to go. Bill Frederick's name is on the side as the car's designer and builder. Hal Needham is the owner, and Stan Barrett is the driver. He's a friend of Needham's, another Hollywood stuntman, a veteran of movies like Little Big Man, The Drowning Pool, Smokey and the Bandit, a whole bunch of others. The whole team, they call themselves Project SOS, Speed of Sound. Here's the car on the Bonneville Salt Flats. 39 feet long, 24 inches high. That's two feet high. Take off the canopy and you could literally drive this thing under my desk here, up to the 10 foot wide uh, outrigger wheels in the back. 
and it's only 20 inches wide, just wide enough to accommodate Stan Barrett's shoulders. Total weight, 4,000 pounds, more than a third of that fuel. Total thrust, well, uh, reports have it ranging from around 15,000 pounds up to 24,000 pounds. Even at the low end, though, that's a thrust-to-weight ratio of nearly 4 to 1. Pretty darn good. Budweiser rockets should go fast, right? It should break some records. Well, yes and no. The car was light, and it put out a lot of thrust, but that thrust didn't last very long. 10 seconds, 12 seconds, whatever, and the tank is burned dry and the solid-fueled boosters burned up. So when Project SOS starts making runs at Bonneville in September 1979, the car can't sustain a record-breaking speed over a full mile to officially break Gary Gablich's land speed record. It was just like Walt Arfon's Wingfoot Express rocket car back in 1965. Massive power, massive thrust, massive G's on the driver, but it only lasted for a few seconds. So what the Project SOS team did was, they ignored the rules of land speed racing and made up a new game. They set the timing clocks very close together, not a mile apart, but one one-hundredth of a mile apart, 52.8 feet. With this setup, they were able to record Budweiser rocket hitting a top speed of 638 miles per hour. 16 miles per hour faster than Gablich's record. It wasn't an official record, but it made the newspapers just the same. And that annoyed a few people, including Gary Gablich himself. He said at the time, quote, rules should not be changed to accommodate a vehicle. Gablich also made the good point that with the clocks so close together, an error of a hundredth of a second could throw off the correct time by as much as 150 miles per hour. So the Budweiser rocket had gone 638, unofficially, very unofficially. Next up, December 17th, 1979, it's going after the speed of sound on land. This time, the car will be run at Edwards Air Force Base on Rogers Dry Lake. The location is significant. Edwards was where Chuck Yeager became the first man to do Mach 1 in an airplane back in 1947. Now a car will break Mach 1. That's the plan. And Chuck Yeager will be there to see it. Hal Needham has him under contract to lend his name to the project and to give it his seal of approval. Needham also has a TV crew on hand. Stan Barrett is going to break the speed of sound on live TV. He does it early in the morning, when the temperature and in turn the speed of sound is lower. And guess what? He succeeds! Project SOS claims that the Budweiser rocket hit a top speed of 739 miles per hour, supposedly a hair over the speed of sound, Mach 1. Hal Needham gets Chuck Yeager to write a letter to back up the claim. Okay, so let's look into this claim. Did the Budweiser rocket really break the speed of sound, even for a fraction of a second? Well, for starters, it should be pointed out that the speed of sound is not a ground velocity. It's an airspeed, the speed that sound travels through the air, which varies depending on atmospheric conditions, first and foremost, on the temperature. When you're in an airplane at an altitude of 40,000 feet or whatever, like Chuck Yeager was, it's very cold up there, so the speed of sound is lower, let's say around 660 miles per hour. Down on the ground, where it's much warmer, you'd have to go maybe 750 miles per hour to surpass the speed of traveling sound waves. So a speedometer or any kind of speed measuring device they're basically useless for determining whether you've broken the speed of sound. The real giveaway is the sonic boom. With the Budweiser rocket, there was no sonic boom. Eighteen years later, when Andy Green indisputably broke the sound barrier in Thrust SSC, there was 
It shook windows. Everybody heard it. So that's number one. No sonic boom. Okay, but did the Budweiser rocket really go 739 miles per hour, as claimed? If that isn't Mach 1 on the ground, it's pretty darn close, right? Here again, I think the answer is no. Richard Keller of the Blue Flame team that set the land speed record in 1970, he investigated the Budweiser rocket claim back in 1981, and this is what he discovered. The car was tracked using a U.S. Air Force system called a Digital Instrumented Radar set up four miles away, a system that the Air Force itself confirmed to Keller, quote, is not normally used for timing speed. It was used for visual acquisition and was not calibrated or certified. And it gets worse. An Air Force radar technician followed the car on a TV monitor, manually panning the radar to track it. Partway through the run, the radar beam that the technician was aiming, by hand, lost its fix on the Budweiser rocket and locked onto a water truck that was driving along a service road in the distance beyond it. So that kind of botched the reading right there, a reading that was already pretty dubious to begin with. I mean, the radar wasn't even tracking the car for part of its run. Rather than just toss out the whole thing, though, what the Project SOS team did was that they drove a second vehicle down the course the next day, following the rocket car's tracks, and the technician tracked it with his handheld radar. They then took the data from that, combined it with the data they'd recorded the previous day from the Budweiser rocket, and somehow extrapolated that Stan Barrett hit a top speed of 739 miles per hour. In an email he sent to me, Dick Keller dismissed the whole thing as, quote, mathematical gymnastics. Craig Breedlove called it, quote, unbelievably flawed. But what about the clocks, those drag strip style clocks? Why didn't the Budweiser rocket team use the reading off those clocks to back up their claim? That would have been pretty solid proof. I mean, the clocks were there, this time set a 100 feet apart. Earl Flanders, an experienced timing official, he'd been hired by Hal Needham to do the timing. The numbers he recorded, though, were downplayed at the time and were subsequently locked away when doubters like Dick Keller and Craig Breedlove started to question the whole thing. Under the terms of his contract, Earl Flanders had to keep quiet about it, too. He didn't want to get sued. Here's what Craig Breedlove told me. That, that was based on Earl Flanders, who was, the, who was the representative for FIM in the United States, and he does all the official FIM timing. He also timed the Budweiser car, and he was the guy that told me that it went 666 mm -hmm. on the run. And I said, you mean you clocked it? And he said, yeah. He said, I clocked every run. I said, well, I've never heard that before publicized, you know, and he said, well, he said, I was under contract to Hal Needham, and I wasn't uh, allowed to uh, publicize it under the threat of litigation. So that's it for the Budweiser rocket. No sonic boom. Actual clocking data showing it going no faster than 666 miles per hour. Data that Project SOS kept private and the use instead of a highly inaccurate radar tracking method, coupled with what Richard Keller calls mathematical gymnastics, to produce the desired results. The conclusion? Stan Barrett was a massively courageous guy, and went extremely fast in the Budweiser rocket. But he didn't break the speed of sound. See you next time. I got her all the way to four. Again. Seen to have a problem here? Problem or not, he is underway. From our camera located at the four and a half mile marker, Stan Barrett, up to three miles. If he reaches 700 miles per hour, and he should, he'll be going in excess of 1,000 feet per second. Shoot is deployed perfectly. He's slowing down at the four mile mark.
record. At four and a half now. Slowing down. There he is coming. We got 734 on radar, 739 on airspeed. We probably broke the speed. Of... The dream of Bill Frederick Woo! and Hal Needham for years is attained by...